getting close here, folks. Everybody ready? And it's just go at five or four for central time, right? Four central time, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody out there. Welcome to round 14 of Lincoln Douglas debate at the National Speech and Debate Association 2020 online national tournament. Uh, in this particular debate, we have the affirmative L203 debating the negative L260. Congratulations for being this late in the tournament. Uh, good luck to all the debaters and let the debate begin. Everybody good? All right, perfect. In that case, an imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. Because the words of Plutarch are just as true now as they were nearly two millennia ago, I have firm resolved the intergenerational accumulation of wealth is antithetical to democracy. The value is democracy as implied by the text of the resolution. Harvard professor of government, Sidney Verba defines democracy and its antithesis in 2006, writing, democracy is a political system in which citizens have equal input in making collective decisions. A non-democratic system in turn is a system in which some individual or subgroup possesses superior power to make decisions. Therefore, if democracy rests on whether citizens have equal input, political equality is of the utmost importance. Professor Verba continues, equality is an intrinsic component of democracy. If the ultimate rulers are citizens, decisions are responsive to preferences of the citizenry. Equality means citizens have an equal voice over government. The game of politics played on a level playing field. Democracy depends on citizen consent. Inequalities of voice challenge the legitimacy of government, reducing consent and requiring coercive government. Thus the criterion is maintaining political equality. Simply put, the lottery of birth should not determine how politically powerful someone is in a democracy. My sole contention is that intergenerational wealth compounds economic inequality, skewing political power. Every generation, more and more wealth is funneled into a more and more concentrated group of people. Money builds on money, and while the average citizen sees the ups and downs of the economy, struggles to pay for college, and hopes their children are better off than they were, the rich buy a fast pass to success and skip all that. Every additional million in their bank account grows exponentially through the advantages it nets the next generation in their dynasty. Senior reporter Hilary Hafauer, citing the Institute for Policy Studies, writes in 2019, the median American family owns just over $80,000 in wealth, while 15 family dynasties own $618 billion. Each of these families' wealth comes from an earlier generation, a wealth dynasty passing generation to generation. Since 1982, the wealth of three families increased by 5,868%, while the median household wealth decreased by 3%. Folks don't acknowledge the leg up they get buying a house or avoiding debt as a result of generational wealth. But according to the Institute for Policy Studies, the top indicator for economic prosperity is not hard work or intelligence. It's the family you're born into. Generational wealth is a key contributor to the gap between rich and poor. Today's extreme inequality is the result of rapidly growing dynasties. And this isn't from increased incomes or harder work. University College of London economics professor and senior scholar at the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis, Maria Denardi, writes in 2004, wealth is much more concentrated than labor characterized by a tiny fraction of households owning huge estates, transmission of capital from intergenerational links generates a distribution of wealth much more concentrated than that of labor earnings. Intergenerational wealth is the unquestionable culprit of inequality. And that dynastic wealth inequality affords wealthy families disproportionate power and undermines political equality in three parallel ways. First, direct influence. Donations grant donors direct access to elected officials allowing them to successfully influence votes and legislation. Importantly, the larger the contribution, the greater the access, ensuring the power of large donors far outstrips that of average citizens. Professor of law at Boston College, James Rapetti, writes in 2004, large, contrib large contributors have greater access to elected officials than others. Langbean found strong correlation between contributions and the time officials spent with contributors. Contributions around key votes buy access and encourage legislators to participate. Calgano and Jackson found a correlation between contributions to senators and their participation in floor votes. Voting increased as contributions increased. Second, indirect influence. The impact of wealth inequality isn't just reserved for influencing individual politicians or votes. Immense wealth can also translate to undue influence over public opinion and broad political priorities, 
through things like media campaigns or funding partisan think tanks. The Economist writes in 2020, rising inequality boosts the power of the rich, enabling them to counter popular will. The rich shape public opinion, financing think tanks or buying media outlets to shape public narratives about which problems deserve attention. Analysis of bills in nine European countries between 1941 and 2014 found rising inequality is associated with agendas more focused on crime and immigration and less focused on economic justice. The rich have greater ability to emphasize some topics rather than others. Third and finally, dynastic inequality. Intergenerational wealth is uniquely harmful to political equality since it ensures the same families remain powerful continuously, building dynastic wealth rather than new families and perspectives gaining power. This ensures a sort of aristocratic homogeneity where the same ideas and positions remain dominant without challenge because they remain backed by dynastic wealth and power. Professor Rapetti continues, the harmful effects of wealth on the political process are stronger in the cases of dynastic wealth compared to wealth held by different families each generation. Different families bring new perspectives, experiences, and concerns. In contrast, where wealth simply is transmitted from a generation in the same family, it is less certain the subsequent generations will have new perspectives, experiences, or talent. Moreover, these concentrated dynasties will work to actively preserve their unequal power, using their political influence to shut out new people from gaining power, limiting their freedom. Professor Rapetti concludes, wealth passed from generation to generation magnifies political power. Families seeking to preserve their power exercise it to prevent others from acquiring wealth. This creates a royalty addressed in a famous quote attributed to Alexis de Tocqueville, what is most important for democracy is not that great fortunes should not exist but that great fortunes should not remain in the same hands. Thus, I affirm and stand ready for cross-examination. Awesome. Is everyone ready? Then let's begin. So you say the problem with the intergenerational accumulation of wealth is that it distributes wealth and political power arbitrarily, correct? And unequally, yes. Okay. As long as people have wealth, they'll give benefits to their children, right? They'll pay for private school. They'll help them with contacts and jobs and stuff like that, right? Sure, there will be differences in upbringing. Okay. There will be lots of more opportunities for the wealthy as long as they're as long as a wealth so difference. I think the assumption of this question is not relevant to whether or not the resolution is true or false. You're going to cite other instances of inequality, but that doesn't disprove that intergenerational wealth isn't a source of some. That's not where I'm going. Can you just answer the question, please? I will, do. will wealthy people, as long as wealth inequality exists, have additional opportunities that the poor don't have? Yes, as long as wealth inequality exists, then the wealthy will have advantages. Okay, so then by your framework, wouldn't we have to get rid of all wealth or get rid of all money because no, the ultimate- I, I disagree that any amount of inequality upsets political equality. My argument is that large amounts of inequality are problematic for politics. The fact that somebody could make right a decent amount more is not the same as a massive gap. Wait, but what's the bright line? Like wh how I much is- that's too the fallacy of Loki's wager. I don't mean to give you a number of income that is the exact number at which inequality becomes politically disruptive or not. I think we can clearly tell oh, as for the affirmative- Otherwise, we don't know whether yours is actually beyond the barrier. But let's move on. Let's talk about your contention one about uh, you know, wealth concentration, right? Just to be clear, your entire contention is contingent on this one link that inheritance increases inequality, right? I would think the link is more than just a single argument, but if you want to group it as inheritance increases inequality, then yes, it's that argument. So if I take that out, I take out all your arguments, right? Yeah, but I think we have multiple justifications for that. So, so it seems reductive to call it one argument. Okay, so let's talk about well, let's talk about campaign donations. Why is this a problem with the intergenerational accumulation of wealth and not just a reason to do what Sweden does and basically publicly fund campaigns? through? Sure, public so I think our argument has two steps. One is that intergenerational transfer of wealth results in inequality and that inequality in large amounts is undemocratic. Even if you regulate direct donations, there's always going to be back channels and wealthy people will try and influence through those. Wait, do you have any, wait, so you're saying that inevitably money will influence politics, therefore we have to get at the actual inequality, right? Uh, yes, sure. Okay, so, okay, that's awesome. Uh, let's move on to your warrants for why money equals political influence. Let's talk about this evidence from nine European countries. Um, what European countries? I do not know the exact list. All right, who wrote that study? Uh, let me get their exact names. It was published. Actually, it's okay, we can just go into that. It's at in Borghetto, if you still want the names. Borghetto. Okay, awesome, thanks. Um, let's go back to your framework, right? Maintaining political equality. Um, it would People would theoretically have perfect quality of political power if we said everyone has to go to 10 protests a week, everyone has to donate $200 and only $200 to political campaigns, and everyone has to vote. Would that be just- no, no. So Verba explicitly repudiates compulsory things like voting and says that people should have equal access and choice and capability. Not that we require everybody to do the same, but that they have the ability. Okay, so if I choose not to get well, should I have less of a political say than someone who chooses to get uh, well? I don't think somebody born chooses who their parents are. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, do you mind if I see uh, the Institute for Policy Studies evidence in your contention one, uh, ja the Jackson evidence in your first warrant or your first political impact, and then the nine European country studies? Nine European countries, the Institute for Policy uh, Studies, and Jackson. Yep. Thank you so much. For sure. Do you mind if I send it in the body of the email? Oh yeah, I really don't care. Uh, could you just like include a link to the original source or something, please? Uh, yes. Awesome, thank you. I mean, you. the citation obviously has the link. Yeah, awesome, just making sure, thank you. And the other two were Jackson and the economist talking about the nine European countries, correct? Uh, yes, please. Okay, should be sent. Awesome, I'll let you know when I get it. Awesome, just got it, so I'll start prep time now. Hold on, pausing. Um, I think you might have the wrong link on the Repetti evidence. Uh, let me double check then. It's taking me to a different paper called uh, The Distributive Effects of Wealth Taxes. Check that then. I just pause prep. Okay, it took me to that one, so I'll just download the PDF and send it to you if that's okay. Okay, thanks. Um, um, yeah, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. I don't. Okay, no problem. No worries. It might have been like a computer directory thing that I actually put with it. Sometimes I do that without thinking. Yeah, all good. Uh, are you just emailing it to me or? Uh, yeah, I just, I just emailed it, that's fine. Awesome, yeah, that works. Let me just, let you know when you got it. Okay, wait. No, I haven't gotten it yet. Oh, just got it, so I'll continue prep time now.
Awesome, that's about four minutes used. As a brief off-time roadmap, I'll begin by reading the negative case, then move on to refuting the affirmative case. All right, is everyone ready? And I'll begin. Because in any democracy, parents should be able to use their hard earned money to fulfill their most natural instinct of helping their children, I negate, resolved, the intergenerational accumulation of wealth is antithetical to democracy. My value is democracy as implied by the resolution. In a pre-political state of nature, individuals enjoy complete control over their actions and property. However, in the event of a disagreement or if one individual attempts to dominate another and deprive them of that choice, there is no neutral power to arbitrate the dispute. Since individuals want that arbiter of dispute, disputes but also wish to preserve the vast array of choices they have in the state of nature, they form democracies which give them the power to control government. The root of the society, however, is in the preservation of liberties present in the state of nature. Therefore, it would be inconsistent with democracy for a government to exceed the bounds of that explicit purpose. Thus, my criterion is respecting individual liberty. Democracy believes in the fundamental value of people. To deprive the individual of their liberties is to dominate them, reducing their ability to own themselves and their own actions. Democracy believes that people own the state, not that the state owns people. Thus, any democratic society must respect individual choice and liberty. For clarity, I will offer an observation on the burden of the affirmative. Lexico defines antithetical as mutually incompatible. This means that the affirmative cannot solely demonstrate that the intergenerational accumulation of wealth harms democracy. They must prove that democratic government and inheritance cannot coexist. Contention one is monetary mayhem. The intergenerational accumulation of wealth is a critical aspect of one's individual liberty to dispose of duly earned property. Restrictions on that right would unfairly restrict the rights of parents in a way that is antithetical to democracy for two reasons. First, parents retain the right to dispose of justly acquired wealth. Once someone uses their labor to acquire property, they can choose to dispose of that property as they wish. Restrictions on the intergenerational accumulation of wealth would deprive parents of the liberty to use their justly earned property. The burden of this taxation is not just felt among the wealthiest. It also violates the liberties of marginalized communities seeking to use their hard earned money to improve the conditions of their children. Alfred of the National Black Chamber of Commerce explains, quote, supporters of the estate tax argue that very few families are affected by the tax, but they're wrong. Estate taxes were paid by more than 37,000 family businesses and 24,000 family farms, end quote. It is not just small businesses in the United States that rely on inheritance to function. Indeed, Alfred of the, N of, of the National Black Chamber of Commerce estimates that inheritances amount to nearly 13% of net worth for African Americans. Second, the liberty to leave wealth for your children is morally indistinguishable from other essential liberties. Daniel Halliday explains in the Journal of Law and Philosophy in 2013, quote, there is nothing special about transferring one's wealth to heirs compared with other ways of using it, end quote. If the affirmative finds the intergenerational transfer of wealth problematic, then are parents also not allowed to pay for their child's college, pass down family heirlooms, and put money in their piggy banks? Because in a democracy and any government, parents ought to have these basic liberties, I negate. Now let's move on to my opponent's case. As a broad overview to his entire case, two problems. First, he never meets the burden of the affirmative. Remember what my lexico definition tells you. Antithetical means cannot coexist. Insofar as democracies exist generally, and there hasn't been a single country that has completely eliminated inheritance in the intergenerational transmission of wealth, he obviously hasn't met his burden yet. Second of all, he cannot just show to you why wealth among the 1% is problematic, right? Because that's all he's doing in his case. Wealth is defined by Investopedia as the total accumulation of your like assets of your material resources, right? He needs to explain why it's also antithetical to democracy for the impoverished to send their money down to their children. I would theorize that for the impoverished to spend the money they've spent their entire life working, uh, earning down to their children is obviously not antithetical to democracy. Now let's move on to his framework. On his definition of democracy, he may, he gives you a really, really important line, and that's that democracy requires consent. If you want to look at consent, we have to look at the conditions upon which we originally consented to the government when we exited the state of nature. When we did that, we put conditions on the government's existence that it can't violate our liberties and property rights because we explicitly created the government to preserve those rights. Now let's move on to his criterion of maintaining political equality. Three responses. First, you can't use undemocratic means to pursue democratic ends. Even if political equality is a really, really good goal, you can't violate people's basic liberties to get there. For example, you certainly could guarantee perfect political equality if you said, well, everyone has to vote. But you, we acknowledge that that's a terrible thing because people have this fundamental side constraint that you can't violate their liberties. Second of all, his solution to political inequality is the wrong way, right? He's saying that the problem, or that the solution to a problem where some people have a lot and a lot of people have very little is to basically take money away from everyone. I would say the solution to that situation is to basically improve economic growth so that everyone can have something, right? It's not to take away inheritances away from everyone. It's to try to make sure that we can give an inheritances to everyone. With that, let's move on to his contention one about wealth concentration. Remember his entire contention and his entire 
case is contingent upon this one argument that inheritance causes inequality. There are eight reasons why that's not true. First, inequality is already decreasing. Credit Suisse finds in a 2018 report that the share of wealth held by the top 5% has decreased since the turn of the century. This is better than my opponent's evidence about wealth inequality because it's global, whereas his evidence is only about the United States. Second, he doesn't even reduce inequality. Even if parents can't give an inheritance to their child, they can still send them to private school, provide them with context and jobs, which gives those children a massive leg up over other kids. Third, inheritance isn't the cause of wealth concentration among the rich. Benton of Duke University explains that most bequests occur in middle to late life after households have either established a clear wealth accumulation trajectory or accumulated the bulk of their wealth. Fourth, you can turn the argument inheritances cause long-term solutions to economic malaise for the least well off. Mangue of the New York Times in 2018 explains that when the wealthy receive inheritances, they typically use that to invest in businesses that then create jobs for the unemployed. This is a better, more long-term solution to, uh, uh, this is a better, more long-term solution to inequality because it provides the impoverished with a medium, medium to long-run stable source of income and a company in which to rise the economic ladder. Moreover, the Center for um, uh, American Family Economics estimates that family businesses create, produce 78% of new job creation in America. Fifth, you can turn the argument again. Inheritances are key for many in less economically well-off countries to escape extreme poverty. Mango of the ILRI finds in 2009 that in Kenya, property inheritance from parents and relatives was responsible for 20% of household escapes from poverty. Six, six, empirics prove that in the real world, inheritances can reduce in inequality. Bozerup of the University of Copenhagen found in 2016 that in Denmark, the repeal of inheritance taxes reduced the share of wealth held by the 1% by 6%. Prefer our evidence because it includes quantifications. Now let's move on to the evidence he reads in this contention. He reads this Denardi evidence to basically say that inheritance causes inequality. But here's the problem with the Denardi evidence, and I'm going to quote it. Results I, I report in the paper do not make any adjustments on consumption and utility for the demographic changes the household is undergoing over time. So it just looks at inheritances. It doesn't look at how people also spend those inheritances. So it doesn't actually have an accurate picture of wealth accumulation. Now let's move on to his contention about, uh, to his arguments about political power. Right off the bat, two reasons why wealth does not equal political power in general. First, turn. Hilbig of Harvard University finds in 2019 that inheritances to towards female descendants in municipalities in Western Germany helps women increase their representation in local political councils. Now let's move on to his first warrant about direct influence through donations. First, this isn't a reason why inheritance is antithetical to democracy. It's a reason why donations are antithetical to democracy. Second, the solution is to just do what Sweden does and publicly fund all our campaigns. He reads this third argument about dynastic inequality, but that argument is really bad. Hill of Market Watch finds in 2017 that 70% of inherited wealth is lost by the second generation, 90% by third. Across. Uh, yep. Perfect. Let's start by talking about the last argument you made, citing Hill of Market Watch in the study where they identified the sort of 10% rule by the third generation. Were they looking at inheritance just among the wealthy or amongst all people who inherit? Uh, the title of the card is specifically among wealthy families. Sure, but I'm asking about the study that Hill of Market Watch, somebody with no qualifications, is citing. I mean, Hill is a qualified writer at Market Watch. Market Watch is a like organization that writes a lot about it's investments. like a stocks blog but let's get back to my original question about the study someone who writes about investments is very credible let's get back to the study being cited the one by delaney do you know the scope of people looked at i mean i can't tell you but i can okay. tell you what specifically That's fine. uh let's go to the negative case so first let's talk i guess about sub point a in the first contention where do you justify one, that wealth and inheritance is also connected to somebody like passing along a family business. What? Oh, so I would say that family businesses are your property, right? When we create a business or when we incorporate it and when it becomes our property, that's our property, right? So like- How many I have people are like doing that intergenerationally as opposed to like they retire? What do you mean? My question is like, the resolution is about like inheritance and bequests. People don't really bequest their business. Like most people aren't still owning their business on their deathbed. I mean, they can. Lots of people are still majority like shareholders or lots of people are still advisors on the board of directors of their companies right before they die. You can't make this. Yeah, business. probably for boards of directors for the super wealthy, but most family businesses don't have boards of directors. That's I mean, lots right. of family businesses have people who let's, run the business. If it's in the family, then it's necessarily the parent let's, who's like running let's, it, right? Let's keep going, please. Uh, first, let's talk about this first argument you make on the affirmative contention when you say inequality is generally going down. Where are they getting this data? What measure are they using? Yeah, so that's Credit Suisse. It looks at the top share. Of, that's Credit Suisse. It's this uh, international organization that looks at, looks at a lot of wealth data. So what it concludes is that the top share of wealth held by the 5% has been reducing since the turn of the century. And that's really important because it tells you that the problem you are proposing or the problem you are saying exists in the like, like with inheritance isn't really a problem. So the percent of total wealth held by like the top 5% has been declining is what they say. Yeah, since the turn. Okay, of the how do they measure wealth? Uh, I can provide you with the evidence. I think they look at like the total proportion of like 
wealth and like accumulated assets held by the top 5%. Sure. Uh, lastly, let's move to the argument about Denmark. So what did this study find happened to absolute inequality? Um, so what it concluded is that the top share of wealth held by the 1% decreased by 6%. So that tells you that the what money- What did it say about the total size of the gap between the poor and the rich? I mean, that doesn't matter as much as where the money is going, right? It's going away from the 1%. That 6% of wealth is going away from the 1% and towards the 99%. And, and sort of the issue you're problematizing in your case is that the 1% is gaining more wealth, time but frame? I'm saying that the reverse, what? Never mind, that's fine. We're out of time. Uh, I'll just run prep starting now. Could you send me the credit sweep evidence? I'll just like run prep while you're sitting here. Just sent it. I'll show you where it is in the evidence. I just sent the full PDF for convenience. Do you want me to show you now? Uh, I'll just open the PDF in a second. It's all good. Gotcha. Yeah, just let me know when you want. It actually should be highlighted in there. It'll just be on page 16. Got it. Got it. Okay, I'll stop there. I'm going to stop at 55 left. Does that sound right? I wasn't timing, but I trust you. In my case, I have 10 minutes left. Uh, <laughs> the order will be the affirmative, sort of both frameworks at once, starting the affirmative, and then affirmative contention, negative contention. Is everybody good? All right, perfect. Hold up. All right, starting now. Starting on the overviews made to the affirmative case, first on the definition of antithetical. I would argue that the burden the negative is trying to extrapolate from the word antithetical is absurd. They're saying I have to prove every democracy collapses if it has intergenerational accumulation of wealth. Obviously, if I, if I prove that it opposes or directly opposes the things necessary to democracy, like political equality or liberty, that's sufficient. Think if you could ever vote affirmative if I had to prove every democratic state collapses. Second, on their argument about wealth, meaning total accumulation. Yes, obviously, people in the lower brackets also inherit wealth, but the affirmative argument is that the majority of wealth inherited 
goes to the upper class, that's where it comes from. Now, let's move to the framework debate. First, on the value of democracy, he says that consent is key, but misses the point Verba makes, which is that you can't have consent if you're unequally represented, because then other people can overrule you, which proves equality comes prior to consenting to things with your liberty. Now, on the criterion debate, makes a couple of responses. First, he says that undemocratic means would be unused, but the affirmative doesn't defend an action. This resolution isn't a policy prescription, which means this response is irrelevant. Next, he says that it's the wrong solution because we take money away from the wealthy. Again, we don't defend an action. Now, I have two responses to the negative this framework. First is that liberty is not sufficient or the only thing characterizing democracy. You can imagine a state that's democratic, even if it has slightly unfair or improperly adjudicated property zoning laws. But if a state lacks equal representation for people, then it's not democratic, which proves equality is more central. Second is that individual liberty ends where inequality begins. You couldn't use your individual liberty to, for example, ban people of color from entering your shop, which demonstrates equality comes first. Now let's move on to the affirmative's first contention. He makes eight responses. But I'll extend the thesis of the affirmative first, which is that wealth compounds. When you inherit large amounts of wealth, it's easier to keep that wealth because you can invest and gain and grow and go to better schools, which is what all of the affirmative evidence says and why we see ongoing concentration of wealth now. Now I'll answer their responses. First, they say inequality has gone down, but what their study actually says is that it went down after the 2008 market crash, which disproportionately affected the wealthy, but they're recovering now. Second, they say that things like private school and other types of influence could also cause inequality. One, that's not the affirmative burden to prove you get rid of all inequality, but second, extreme examples of that are the result of intergenerational wealth, where large amounts of wealth are passed down and benefit people in multiple generations later, which also answers their third response, where they say transfers come later in life. The point is that when you receive them later in life, you can use those to benefit the next generation immediately below yours. For example, a 60-something receives a large inheritance and uses that to benefit their children. Next, they say that the wealthy will invest in businesses, but conceded in the Hoffauer evidence that the median wealth of regular median families has gone down over time, which also answers their fifth response because it proves even if they can cherry pick a few beneficial examples, it still has overall resulted in inequality. They cite the example of Denmark, but don't adjust to the fact that in the long term, the equalizing effect goes away because according to PhDs Nikoya and Syme in 2019, the equalizing short run effect is reverted in 10 years because the rate of wealth depletion varies with heirs' initial wealth. Heirs among the bottom 99% deplete inherited wealth. In contrast, the top 1% remain intact, which is why the study found in the long term, absolute inequality increased. Then they say that wealth has increased power, citing women in Germany who gained power. But because that inheritance was gained unequally, only certain women gained power. Finally, they say that donations aren't the same thing as intergenerational wealth, but conceded my second example, which is that they can use it to influence media and public opinion, which is totally unresponded to. But even if donations might be the source of one problem. There are other ways money can influence politics which they haven't responded to. Finally, they read the Hill evidence saying that 70% lose their money by the second generation, but that's because that includes low income families who consume it faster. Now let's move to the negative case. I've already responded to the framework, so I'll just do the contention. First is that property rights are not unabridgeable, especially in the face of inequality. Think of something like trust busting. Somebody can't use their individual liberty to acquire a monopoly because that could result in inequality. Second is that people who are dead do not have the same property rights as a living person because they're not a rights claimant. That's why there's a lower standard to exhume a body than search a living person's house. Third is that it's unearned because the recipient is random. And fourth and finally is that passing down a business is done while somebody is alive and retiring, not on their deathbed, so it's not a transfer post-death. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I just realized. I'm gonna use the rest of prep time starting right now. Um, as a brief off-time roadmap, I'm going to go over the negative case, then the affirmative case, then key voting issues. Is everyone ready? Then let's begin. The thesis of the negative case is that while inheritance might cause some undemocratic outcomes, we must recognize that it is a fundamental democratic right 
that is justified in a democracy through that right. With that, let's move on to my framework on my criterion of protecting individual liberties. Right off the bat, my opponent concedes two really important arguments. First is the analysis of what a gov of why democracies are created. Remember that democracies are created out of a state without government so that our liberties can be preserved. So it would be wholly antithetical to the purpose of a democracy or to a democracy for the government to then trample over those liberties. Now, my opponent is going to get up in his next speech and he's going to make an argument like this, right? If the, uh, just because something, uh, just because like, like protecting liberties is the purpose of a democracy does not mean it's just, does not mean governments should protect liberties. But the point is that this resolution is asking what a democracy should do. Insofar as the purpose of a democracy, as my opponent concedes, is to protect liberties, he cannot violate liberties. He has to acknowledge that inheritance is a fundamental protected right. Now let's talk about the arguments he makes. First, he says that, well, a Democrat's democratic state would be a democratic state even if there were slight property rights violations. And he gives the example of zoning, but he misses the point that when the government begins abridging our property rights, it becomes oppressive. It begins doing a lot of terrible things. We can even use his own example. When the government interferes in property lines, you get things like redlining, which disproportionately disenfranchise communities of color. That's the problem. When the government assumes more power, it is almost never in, it is almost never in tune with the oppression it is always in tune with the oppressor. The second response my opponent makes is that individual liberty extends to the point where it creates inequality. And he gives the example of me refusing to serve a person of uh, like an African-American or something like that, right? But that example is fundamentally different than what the affirmative is saying, right? I would say that I don't have a right to deny service to an African-American because that's me directly harming them. It's me directly taking away from their actions. The difference is that when the wealthy get an inheritance or when the wealthy accumulate wealth, they're not taking that money directly from someone else who is entitled to it. Now let's move on to my contention one about uh, property rights, right? First, he uh, just reiterates again that my property rights are not unabridgeable, right? We can take them away when they harm people. But the problem is you can only take them away when you're literally through one direct action harming another person. If you justify this sort of like idea where the government can take away our property rights whenever we cause an indirect harm upon someone else, then the government is justified in any action. If I step out into the street, I could theoretically distract a driver and that might lead them to crash and hurt them. That doesn't, does that mean that I can't step out in the street. Second of all, he says that dead people don't have rights because basically they have less of a moral claim. But the problem is, A, they have a moral claim to write that inheritance when they're alive, and B, the person who is inheriting the wealth has a right to that wealth when they actually, when the inheritance is actually signed. Now, my opponent concedes a really important piece of evidence here, and that's that the property rights of white wealthy people are not the only property rights being violated. Remember that 13% of wealth for African Americans comes from inheritance. That's really important because the affirmative is not just hurting wealthy white families, they're hurting African American families. If I work my entire life, to overcome systemic oppression and earn that money, then I should be able to give that money to my child so they don't have to fight the same fight against oppression that I did. This is a really important argument in this round, right? Even if you buy all my opponent's arguments for why basically the inheritance among the 1% is really unjustified, is really antithetical to democracy, remember that it isn't, it isn't always antithetical to democracy, right? When African Americans inherit wealth, when they use that to help their children overcome oppression, that is obviously consistent with democracy. It even links into his own framework by guaranteeing them political equality. With that, let's move on to his case. Let's move on to his criterion of maintaining political equality, right? I make a really important argument that you can't use undemocratic means to pursue democratic ends. You can't violate people's basic liberties, even if it maximizes political equality. He responds by saying, well, the resolution isn't a policy action, but here's the problem. My property rights are protected through an inheritance. It would be disrespectful to those property rights to say that that inheritance is then antithetical to democracy. My whole point is that uh, my property rights are consistent with democracy because they are my property rights because because they are my fundamental democratic right. With that, let's move on to my opponent's contention one. Remember, his entire contention is contingent upon this one argument that inheritance increases inequality. So if I take this out, I take out every single piece of offense he has in this round. He's conceded way too much to win this argument. First, remember what the mango of ILRI evidence tells you. 20% of people who escape from extreme poverty in Kenya do so because of inheritance. He just 
responds by saying, well, the median wealth of people who have inheritance is going down. A, that evidence is only from the US. B, that doesn't matter insofar as inheritance was still a tool by which this 20% of these people were able to escape extreme poverty. Remember that there are lots of people who really, really need this wealth to escape poverty, to sort of overcome oppression. We shouldn't deny it to them. The second really important argument I make is from this Credit Suisse evidence, which tells you that inequality is already decreasing. He just responds by saying, the evidence only says that inequality decreased after 2008. That's half of the evidence. If you read the entire sentence, it says that inequality since the beginning of the century, since the turn of the century, has been down. That piece of evidence goes functionally conceded, and it's really important because it takes out his entire case. With that, let's move on to key voting issues. My first key voting issue is you can't use undemocratic means to pursue democratic ends. Remember, the purpose of government is to protect liberties. That means that the government cannot violate my fundamental liberties. My my second key voting issue is that he uses undemocratic means. Remember that he deprives African Americans of 13% of their net worth. They earn that money. They should be allowed to keep it so their children don't have to fight the same fight that they did. Third, remember that he doesn't actually do anything to mitigate inequality. He doesn't improve political equality because inequality is already decreasing. We don't need to violate everyone's basic liberties to guarantee political equality because liberties and undemocratic means do not, or just, do not justify undemocratic ends. I strongly stand in negation. Okay, I'll run the rest of my prep starting now. Time. Uh, the order will be framework, affirmative case, negative case. I'll highlight the voting issues throughout. Is everybody good? All right. Starting now. Starting on an important point that wasn't really touched on in the last speech was the argument about what antithetical means. A lot of the negatives said things like, if I prove in this one instance, then it's not entirely oppositional to democracy, but didn't respond to my argument that saying a single example negates is an absurd burden that misunderstands the on balance nature of LD. So keep that in mind when he's citing these individual examples. With that, let's move to the framework. Now, there's an important concession made by the final speech, which was this argument about consent. They didn't respond to the definition of democracy by Berber, which says it relies on the idea of consent. That's where things like liberty come from and equality from them. But there can't be proper consent if somebody isn't fairly or equally represented in their government, because then they don't have power over the decisions it's making, which means they're both being unequally represented and their liberty is violated, which demonstrates that violating my criterion results in a violation of theirs. Next, they didn't respond to the fact that equality is foundational to democracy. Even in an instance where I said, if there's some improper zoning laws, they were like, that's undemocratic because it results in redlining, which is an inequality, which means they traced their way back to my criterion as a justification for why that's bad, not inherent in the minor violation of property rights, improper zoning could result in. But a society with inequality or a society where somebody's not represented in government is intrinsically undemocratic. So if I demonstrate intergenerational wealth results in political inequality, I've demonstrated that it's undemocratic, it's in opposition to democracy, and therefore I've affirmed the resolution. With that, let's go to the affirmative case and start on the first voting issue for the round, which is that economic inequality translates to political inequality. And this is a pretty easy voting issue because the final negative speech didn't address this. They didn't go for any of their responses to my list of reasons about direct in influence, controlling the media and dynastic wealth that result in wealth inequality, distorting politics, giving greater influence to the wealthy and allowing them to control it on a level regular people can't access, which is political inequality and is antithetical to democracy. So now all I need to prove is the second voting issue, which is that intergenerational wealth results in inequality. Now he extends two arguments. First is this data from the credit union. 
couple of problems. One is that he's just not right about what it says. Here's a quote. But in 2016, the share of the top percent rose back to above the level we estimate, which means it did rebound. I can show you the line if you'd like. But second, this evidence doesn't say that intergenerational wealth is why inequality is decreasing. There could be a number of other factors, but intergenerational wealth still hampers it. Other than that, he hasn't really responded to the idea of compounding wealth, building on each other, other than this one example of Kenya. But importantly, and this will also take out its data about African-American families can see that all other studies look at it in the short term, but don't recognize the effect long-term consumption has on low-income families. In the short term, they see a gain, but because they have immediate needs like debt that they pay back, in the long run, the effect of inequality still rises, which was a conclusion of one of their own studies that they themselves cited, which demonstrates intergenerational wealth results in inequality. Finally, I'll respond to their contention with two arguments. First, they say that the inheritor has a right, so it doesn't matter if the person passing it down is dead, but concedes that they didn't earn it by working, they got it by chance. And lastly, in their response to the argument about trust busting, they say that the government couldn't restrict you from stepping into the street, but like that's jaywalking, that's literally illegal and they do restrict that because it causes harm, which demonstrates that your freedom doesn't extend to harming others or causing inequality like with trust busting. Thus, I affirm. Great round. Good round, yeah. Thank you all for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both.
Okay, so um, I guess I was the last one. Uh, I'd like to congratulate both of you guys. This was one of the most impressive debates I've ever seen. Um, it was, uh, I don't know about the other judges, but it was uh, very close for me to decide. Uh, in a 2-1 decision, it uh, goes to the affirmative. Good round. Yeah, great round. This was fantastic. Thank you all for judging.